Welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Angela Fell from the Neighbourhood Democracy Movement. Uh, and as Peter Block always says, whoever is in the room is exactly who should be uh, in the room. So we've got a, a lovely uh, intimate gathering today. Uh, a few, about a month ago or so, I was asked to go and chat at the local trust uh, event for our the local trust programmes about some of the work of the neighbourhood democracy movement. And I met Sarah, who works alongside Rebecca, and listened to the story, uh, or some of the story, about what was happening where they live. And given that the neighbourhood democracy movement is basically around connecting people together and sharing the great stuff that's already happening in places uh, all over the country, I thought that we would invite Rebecca in to uh, tell us a little bit about what they do. And Anna, unfortunately, is poorly uh, with her daughter, uh, which means, actually, we just get all of Rebecca's knowledge and experience you know, uh, to, to share with us uh, today. She's got the whole space. So we're going to you know, just think about really why was it important for you to come here today? What are you coming for? Why have you given up this time? Why have you put yourself back on Zoom uh, on a Friday afternoon? You know, uh, what is it that kind of you're showing up for? You, know, you don't need to share that with anybody, but just have a think about that. And then I'm going to hand over in a minute to Rebecca, who's going to give us a, a lively overview. And then we'll just keep it nice and loose and, you know, open the floor for some questions, think about some possibilities. It, uh, I think I, I, I did put in chat, but if you arrive later, it's been recorded just so that we can share it with people who uh, couldn't be here or sections of it uh, with that. And Simon is here too from the Citizen Network and Neighbourhood Democracy Movement, as well as looking like he was spinning the tunes on the decks, is also uh, possibly editing it down later. So welcome, uh, Rebecca. Uh, I'd like to invite you in. Thank you, Angela. Yeah, it's really great to be here. It's uh, lovely to um, be sharing this work with you. Thanks for inviting us. And yeah, I'm sorry, it's just me today. It would have been me and Anna. We both run the Portland Inn Project um, in Stoke-on-Trent. I'm calling in from my studio, which is just full of bags for life. <laughs> and Ikea bags here in Stoke-on-Trent uh, in, in an area called Hanley which is in the city centre um, and just five minutes up the road from where our community organisation is based. Um, I'm gonna share with you a slideshow um, and I'll probably talk, I don't want to talk for much more than about I don't know 20 minutes or so and then sort of open up for questions and discussion um, is that okay, Angela? Yeah? Great. So is everyone ready? I'm gonna, um, oh, maybe, you, is it okay for like people to introduce themselves and where they're from? That would be really interesting for me. If that's okay, if anyone's willing to do that. Yeah, great. So that's, that's my introduction. <laughs> um, shall I? hand over to um, Kate Broadhurst, is it? And then if you can yeah. pass on someone else, thank you. you will do. Good afternoon, I'm Kate Broadhurst. Um, I work at Loughborough University, I do research there, and I'm interested in the governance of inclusion and in particular looking at sort of community power, neighbourhood renewal. So I'm sort of listening in to learn a lot about good practice that's going on. Um, so yeah, just looking forward to hearing what you've got to say. Thank you, Kate. Um, maybe Miranda next? Sure. All right. Hi there. Uh, my name is Miranda. I work for an organisation called Creative Sustainability, which is based in Stroud in Gloucestershire. Um, my particular role is to support, well, to come up with a plan for the district of Stroud, which um, has around 120,000 people in, um, around community resilience and doing that through building a network of community hubs. So we have 
it's really learning from the pandemic and how much the community responded um, and how the challenges they faced in the process um, and sort of building on all the good stuff to make it much more sustainable, but really about community power as well. <clears throat> so a little bit about me. Brilliant, thank you, Miranda. Um, uh, Andrew. Hi, everyone. My name is Andy Wilson. Um, I'm the co-director of an organisation in West Yorkshire called Same Skies, which is a citizen-led regional democracy network and think tank for West Yorkshire. Uh, I've come across the Portland Inn project before and really liked it. And I was also very, very struck by the idea of a hundred year plan. I thought that sounded uh, fantastic. Uh, so I'm looking forward to hearing about that. Thank you, Andy. Um, is it KD or, sorry? No, that's fine. It's Hadi. It's a really oh, sorry, Hadi. And nice I know that was a really good attempt. Thank you. Um, yeah, my name's Hadi. I am a youth and community builder for the Forest Voluntary Action Forum, um, based in the Forest of Dean in Gloucestershire. Um, I was actually sent a link to this event um, by our CEO. Um, and I think for us, a lot of the work we do is around community cohesion um, and kind of, yeah, how we can kind of support the needs of the community. So I'm just really interested in learning what you guys have been doing. Thank you, Hadi. Nice to meet you. And finally, um, Cam Camillo, if you're if you're there, sorry if I've pronounced your name wrong, uh, but if you'd like to introduce yourself, that's great. If not, just put it in the chat, perhaps. Maybe I'll move on. Okay. Is that all right? Um, okay, so yeah, really great to meet you all. Um, and yeah, fair enough, if you want to turn your cameras off, that's okay, of course. Um, and I am just going to share my screen then. Really interesting to know kind of where you're all calling in from and uh, your interests as well. And hopefully um, the kind of overview and context that I'll be giving to the Portland Inn project will be interesting to you. But if there's anything else you need to know more, then yeah, that's what the discussion afterwards will be for. So thanks. Um, share screen. Okay, so I'll just, um, sorry, play this on the start. I think it goes black for a, a very brief moment whilst it thinks about what it's doing. So you can see me at the moment, but I can't see you. My screen's gone black, but just give me a second. There we go. So you should be able to see it full screen, right? Um, okay, so, um, so yeah, the Portland Inn Project, uh, we are a community-based uh, arts organisation um, here in Stoke-on-Trent. Um, and we are um, a team of um, artists and residents um, in a neighbourhood that's very close to the city centre. Um, we're kind of on the peripheries of um, the sort of commercial bit, so right next to a sort of shopping centre and on the edge of a big brownfield, which I'll talk a little bit about later. But our, our website we're really proud of, so uh, do have a look when you've got time after this. Um, that gives quite a thorough sort of uh, look into the programme and the people involved in the project. So my name's Rebecca Davis, I'm from London and uh, I live in Stoke-on-Trent and have done for five years now. Um, and I am an artist with a practice that crosses illustration, design, performance and event. And um, I believe in the uh, role of art as making change um, as a device and a platform to represent present and communicate complex stories and politics. I'm a bit of a geek for trying to uh, simplify quite uh, tricky stories and politics with, uh, particularly with illustration, uh, something I really enjoy. Um, but also I really, um, I'm lucky that I get to sort of do that with the project as well. Um, 
Anna, who can't be here today, um, she um, is also an artist and she's an associate professor of fine art um, and social practice at Staffs Uni just up the road. And her work aims to create space to discuss and reframe city resources through participatory art interventions. And both of us collaborate uh, with the community of Portland Street in Stoke. And uh, the intention is to deliver community-led change in an area of the city which has been through significant regeneration programs over the past 20 years. So a little bit about Portland Street and the streets that run off it. We uh, work with about 500 households uh, in the neighborhood. Um, and um, uh, it's, it's an area where the pound housing scheme was first introduced. And it's a little bit different to the scheme that you might have heard of uh, that's uh, happened in Liverpool, where um, the council bought uh, some housing stock that had previously um, was supposed to be uh, bulldozed um, and to make way for new housing as part of the Pathfinder scheme, which was an intervention back in the sort of uh, late 90s, noughties kind of time. Um, and yeah, so basically um, uh, the, that, scheme kind of partly failed here um, and it sort of stalled basically for a number of reasons. Um, so the council were left with quite a significant amount of um, housing um, that was then sort of left derelict for a number of years. So the pound housing scheme was introduced to um, take over those houses, uh, renovate them with a lot of EU funding actually. Um, and then uh, people could uh, pay a deposit of one pound um, with uh, a number of conditions around it. So I'm getting the keys to my pound house on Monday um, because there's been a second um, round of the pound housing, but Anna is a pound house owner. Um, so, and then you pay off, she's had to pay off £30,000 um, over a time between five and 15 years, basically. And one of the conditions of that scheme is that you're very active in the community. Um, so uh, I think about 30 houses were bought up um, in that first scheme and 30 individuals, families, couples moved into those properties. Now, I was doing a touring project at the time called the Oasis Social Club that celebrated um, the sort of traditions of working men's clubs, uh, but also uh, brought up some of the problems around um, them not feeling very inclusive of um, lots of people in the community. And one of the places that we toured to was Stoke and the street that we came to was Portland Street. And, um, there was a lot of conversation um, in the week that I was there as an artist. And it was quite interesting because I was able to kind of create quite a neutral space uh, because I hadn't lived in the area, because I wasn't connected to the council and because I wasn't a pound house owner at the time. And so a lot of the discussion that was raised during that time was around this influx of pound house owners but there being a very strong existing community that were being told that they weren't community minded. And so the, the, the council's kind of intervention was really them sort of saying, this is how we're gonna kind of create a better community here, which actually was quite damaging for that existing community. So what was raised was that a space was needed for people to come together and um, sort of work through these tensions that they could kind of create together. And a request was made to turn the old derelict pub into a community center. The community hall had been shut for a number of years. The pub had been derelict for 10 years and the corner shop was closed for a few years as well. So there wasn't actually any infrastructure for um, the kind of in influx of new residents. So, 
I kind of returned to Stoke and then I ended up moving here um, to continue those conversations with residents. One of the residents was Anna and um, uh, basically we both started collaborating and figuring out if people wanted a space, what would that space look like? And that was really the kind of start of the Portland Inn project. This was back in 2015, 2016. So um, fast forward, we've um, negotiated a community asset transfer of the old pub building. We have worked with an architect over years with, uh, and with residents to figure out the right architectural plan in, in response to people's needs and desires in the local area. And we've been running a programme since 2016 that involves a youth club, a women's group, we have weekly sports, monthly socials, a gardening club, and we offer lo lots of different sort of um, activity, even though Anna and I, our main kind of interest is uh, creativity, um, it's really important to us that the programme is very responsive to what locals uh, request and need. Um, so Anna's practice was very interested in sort of, um, as an artist with a socially engaged practice, what would happen if she lived where she worked? And so being a pound house owner was also kind of a bit of a, um, a research for her as well. And a, a way that she could kind of activate and um, uh, be an artist on the street and host workshops and events. Um, and this is something that we're both very interested in, I think, with the project. So it can be lots of different things when we've kind of set up on the street. It's a ceramics workshop. It can be an architecture school, and it has been. The kids have set up a cafe. We've had boxing clubs, fashion studios. But all along the way, um, it's very important to us that could, the community members are part of the decision making. And the way that we go about that is we've set up a community decision-making panel. Uh, so that's made up of residents. It's made up of um, representatives from the partners that we have, which are arts organizations and also services from the local council. And it's also got representatives from the policing team as well. So there's a whole host of kind of uh, voices there that are part of our community decision-making panel. And I'm very happy to answer some questions about that later to go into a little bit more detail about what that involves. So activities in a busy program are really great um, and we have lots of fun doing that, but what about the time to listen and learn from each other? So it's really important to us that um, Anna and I are always creating space um, to have that discussion and to ask important questions and to really listen to residents because that's really how we then come about with ideas for the programme and different sort of projects that we do. We recently described it actually as kind of like, there's sort of um, three tiers sometimes, I think to the running of our organisation where there's a thread and the thread is like, the sort of so such simple things as kind of constantly having a space for people to come to to have a cup of tea and to just uh you know chat with neighbors um and running a um a regular youth club that kind of thing is the thread but then we have what we call swells and that's where sometimes we work with really rad artists um or gardeners um who have uh, expertise in sort of different areas in response to kind of uh, what locals might have requested. And those are usually art projects and they're really exciting and they're surprising. And that's really, it's through one of those swells that the 100 year plan came, which I'll talk about in more detail in a bit. Um, and then the third tier is kind of the overseeing and this kind of umbrella of constantly sort of stepping back and looking out to the neighbourhood and really thinking about its ecology and all of us and our different contributions and what that means. So that's kind of more the sort of strategizing. I hope that makes sense. 
but I'm just thinking about it loads because we've been running for five years now and um, we're sort of talking lots about governance and what that means for our tiny but growing organisation. So things like this, this is our Portland Pigeon. Um, and this came about because we had a hole in the roof of the pub. So um, the pub's pretty inaccessible and we operate uh, from a shipping container that we adapted. But um, we still try to prevent too much water from getting into the pub because we're about to renovate it. And it's in a, it's in a dire state because we were given it in a dire state. We know what we're getting ourselves into, but there was this hole in the roof. And um, we thought about ways that we were just going to get someone in to mend it. But then we started looking into kind of ridge tiles and decorative ridge tiles. And usually the kind of decorative ridge tiles and finials that you'd get on stately homes. And we thought, oh, we, we would love to develop one with the residents for our pub. And then we thought about kind of the pigeon. So ordinarily you get gargoyles or eagle, eagles and kind of very ornate birds. And then we thought about the pigeon as being kind of actually more symbolic of our area. So running through, kind of coursing through our, through our veins for everyone involved in the project is about um, challenging a negative stigma that the neighborhood has felt for a long, long time. So with things like the pound housing where existing community members were told, you know, you've not been community minded and we're gonna try and improve the area. It really grates on people. And also people are quite sort of exhausted uh, from that negative stigma. And, you know, it's, it's something that we're really trying to kind of rewrite basically. And the pigeon sort of became a bit of a mascot for us all because pigeons historically, um, you know, they're seen as pests, they're seen as vermin, but they have this dual nature where what, on the one hand they're pests and vermin, but on the other hand, historically, they're working birds that have traveled treacherous conditions to fly home. And for us, it was, that was, that's the kind of story that we're sort of trying to push. So it's that kind of, it, they, pigeons just seem like a perfect kind of mascot. So, since 2017, we started prototyping these birds and on the street, the kids were making pigeons and then we created molds for these pigeons and they became a, a product for our social enterprise. But we realized that through this project that's kind of gone on for years, this is a really great way of developing skills in the area. So in the whole prototyping stages and designing, but also the making, and now residents are product makers of our social enterprise. So we have these kind of what we call pigeon drops, maybe twice a year and we sell a load of pigeons and that goes back into our social enterprise. And they've got a ridge, so you can have them rounded, but they've also got a ridge so you can fit them on uh, ridge tiles. And so this is just one example of kind of solving a problem and it being quite creative and engaging and fun, but also a way and a space that we can kind of develop skills um, and it become another kind of part of retelling the story uh, for our neighborhood. So yeah, it's uh, we, we've had an online shop and we've also run a, a shop that we, in the shopping center as well, that everyone was very pleased about because we're opposite New Look. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, been a, it's been a lovely sort of, um, thing to do consistently. And this is the building, uh, this is the plan. So uh, the uh, architectural plan that we worked with residents over years um, was finalized in 2018 and we got planning permission um, only this year actually. So we're just raising funds to renovate the building and this will be the space that we can kind of grow from basically because the shipping container is great and we'll probably continue to run from the shipping container and our youth club will kind of take ownership of that. But this building will really allow us to grow and be ambitious. And importantly, it's a safe, warm, beautiful space and a kind of artwork that we hope will be a kind of beacon for the neighborhood. 
And this is just a couple of photos from some community decision making panel meetings that we've had. Um, and uh, yeah, before COVID, we it was always a kind of physical scenario. And it was a very sort of special gathering. We'd often have like a three course dinner and um, there's always kind of um, decision making to do and discussion to be had, but it's a very informal environment. Um, it's again, just where there's always food and refreshments and it doesn't feel too kind of, um, uh, uh, what's the word? Where we're just kind of trying to get information out of people basically, because that's just not what we're interested in. We genuinely want to create a sort of social space there. So I want to move on to the 100 year plan. I think I might come back to that slide. This is the brownfield oh. that stood in between Waterloo Road and I won't play that just yet. Um, so the 100 year plan, which I know that you're all interested to hear is a most recent sort of project that we've been developing um, since spring this year. Um, during COVID, um, well, which is obviously ongoing, but um, through the lockdowns, there was a lot of um, on the ground work that we did that was super small scale. Often it was like me and a couple of residents just knocking on people's doors, checking in with everybody, making sure everyone was all right. We had creative packs that we were dropping off um, weekly. We um, set up a kind of a TV show on our website that was uh, where everybody could kind of contribute their own little program um, called PIP TV. Um, and we literally started planting seeds. I had a few conversations with households that time where we've all got yards basically at the back of our terraced houses and people started talking about their yards as a new room in the house, that um, they'd done it up, that they were spending a lot more time in it. They were spending time in it than they'd never spent before. Um, they were doing more activities with their children in the yards. And also they'd started to get quite interested in planting. And in the past, so Anna's the gardener of us, and uh, I have some interest in it, in it, more and more interest um, through this project. But um, we, uh, yeah, she'd sort of set up this gardening club a long time ago. And I remember her telling me the story about, so Community Ken is, uh, is um, a really amazing man who was the caretaker of the community hall that uh, ran from the street years and years and years ago that was shut. And he's kind of become our caretaker. So he's got a key to our space and he sort of um, runs the pizza oven that we built in the summer. And he's also the DJ. And he was quite anti the gardening. And he said to Anna when she first set up the gardening club, oh, not around here, Doc. And um, she was like, oh, charming. And she was really trying to kind of push it, but people at the time weren't so interested or there were a few, but it was quite difficult to kind of keep momentum. Anyway, what was quite interesting during this time was that people in their own spaces started gardening and so had more of an interest in the sort of shared green space and the gardening there as well. So it felt like, actually people were kind of planting seeds of ideas as well. And they were sharing a lot more thoughts about how we can kind of improve the green space that we have. So in response to that, um, we wrote a project with a really amazing artist and gardener called Andrea Koo. She uh, goes by the name B for biodiversity and um, she's based in Liverpool. And uh, yeah, so March this year, we started a project with her and with residents. And she kind of, the way that she sort of talks about gardening is so inclusive and really interesting. She talked about our yards being part of a bigger buffet kind of thing. And that like, you know, anything that we're kind of planting will really support the local ecology. And then she was really able to sort of explain what an ecology meant. 
Um, and so slowly people were kind of really um, becoming more invested in those small seeds and acorns that they could plant and the impact longer term that they could that could have, but also the impact on our wild neighbors as well. I think it's really important to mention um, just briefly, at the same time as us having these conversations with residents about the local ecology, um, the, the brownfield site just neighboring our neighborhood, um, which actually had become an urban woodland, um, you know, it was left to grow for years and years and years. It had a tawny owl, it had lots of wildlife, was suddenly torn down without anybody knowing anything. And it was done in quite a quiet, quick way that seemed really, really strange. Um, and we did this kind of campaign video in response to it because suddenly residents were really upset about it because running parallel to them, recognizing the importance of our local ecology, there was this devastating thing that had happened locally. And so I think that the two kind of activated people even more, got people even more passionate. And it's that thing I remember sort of saying to Anna, oh, it's a shame, isn't it? When like, excuse my French, but shit situations kind of bring us together, but actually it's okay sometimes. And, and it was kind of quite important actually and quite critical. So I hope you can hear this okay. This is the brownfield that stood in between Waterloo Road and Century Street, neglected and rejected for many years because its soil was polluted by the previous tenant. Left alone by humans, it gained new tenants, including hedgehogs and foxes. And, and as the brownfield grew into a verdant inner city woodland, so did its inhabitants. Goldfinches and blackbirds, long-tailed tits and blue tits, Coal tits, magpies, crows, great tits, wood pigeons, and remarkably, tawny owls. These are the inhabitants we know about. There are many more, many, many more on Portland Street. We stand for community. Our neighbours are not just people. It is the wildlife we live with too. On March the 31st, a rapid clearing of the site took place. During nesting season, our neighbours were violently evicted, their homes destroyed. It was con it was a condition of future de development that they clear outside of nesting season and they take care to support these wild inhabitants. Okay, so um, so yeah, it was quite a kind of what felt like quite traumatic for lots of residents actually, and sort of really suddenly people started rallying together. And at the time people were sort of contributing in their many different ways. Some were doing it on, on Facebook, some were doing it on the street, um, some were contacting the local newspaper. And what we recognized were these many, many different sort of ripples that can create waves. And for me, it was just really important to recognize any contribution, small or big, mattered. And we were able to kind of map that. And that also, I think, was quite um, helpful with the 100 year plan. So um, Capability Brown, um, now, Anna's a massive fan and I know a bit about him, but basically was a gardener. <laughs> and I'm sure there are some of you that know a lot more than I do about him, but he um, did some most beautiful kind of estates and uh, beautiful gardens for stately homes and rich people back in the day. But uh, lots of these gardens can be accessed today. And um, he's quite an important reference, I think, for the 100 year plan, because the way that he um, uh, designed those gardens 
was thinking uh, kind of microscopically and on a much, much larger scale as well. So kind of honing in on the seeds, but standing back and looking at the bigger landscape too. And actually this picture um, on the right hand side is Trenton Gardens, which is local to us here in Stoke-on-Trent. And there is a kind of viewing point where you can stand back and it's kind of designed in that way that kind of allows us to sort of think about the, the and see the small and the big. And I think in relation to COVID, this is quite important as well, because it, it's sort of a, a time of kind of strange perspective that we recognized where some stuff is held under kind of a microscope or a magnifying glass and others is more of a kind of telescope. So we've got this kind of very sort of small um, space perhaps that we're operating from if we're in lockdown, but at the same time, we're constantly kind of propelled to, to, to the much bigger angle of kind of, you know, this world view at the moment. Um, and so it got us thinking actually about kind of landscaping with uh, Capability Brown in mind and thinking about the different sort of planting that you do basically when you, when you landscape a garden. And then thinking about that as metaphors for the way that we work. So for instance, when we were working with Andrea Koo and we were just landscaping our very, very small green space, she was quite interested in putting in busy lizzies. And our argument was that we weren't really interested in annuals because whilst they're kind of like fireworks of the moment, you know, they're, they're these like, for instance, busy lizzies, really beautiful and uh, an array of colors, actually they only operate in a kind of single growing season. So this made us think about in relation to our project, oh, well, what are those kind of busy lizzies that we sort of offer sometimes in the program that, you know, are a fireworks display? So make everyone feel fantastic that night and create a kind of memory. But in the long term, is that very sustainable for our organization? Then the perennials, which Anna's a massive fan of, and I am too, um, might not always look that pretty. So for instance, mint actually is a very giving and very generous plant. Uh, you can eat it uh, and it grows quite abundantly, but it's just not necessarily the prettiest um, of plants, but it will come back every year, every year in and out. And then nasturtiums, for instance, these were the, the plants that we first started growing when we did the project with Andrea Koo. So super simple to grow. And again, they grow in abundance and they're quite good actually if you've never really planted before because um, they're very hardy. They sort of come up quite easily. You, you don't need to tend to them too much. And so if you're a gardener for the first time, it's quite exciting and quite sort of simple to kind of look after. And then you keep the seeds and then you can keep growing them back year after year. So thinking back to the 100 year plan then, and this notion that Andrea Koo had kind of proposed to us and then has grown um, over the last year, it really made us think about kind of how actually dreaming in the long term lifts us out of this daily grind and the urgencies and emergencies that we, we feel lots of us have gone through the last couple of years. So it also allows us to think about the legacy of long-term projects. And um, it's been really helpful, I think, during this time. So for us, the acorns are important, but we're also thinking about the oak trees. And we've opened up this discussion as well. So um, as Angela said, um, uh, she met Anna through a local trust conference recently. Local trust are one of our funders with Creative Civic Change. And we open this up to um, other Creative Civic Change organizations, thinking about our garden, if you like, and as a 100 year plan. So representing those small details, but also attending to the wider landscape just as Capability Brown had kind of um, championed. And using the notion of the garden as a way of thinking about how we develop and fund projects longer term. Um, and we think it's a really useful exercise. You know, 
Creative Civic Change has funded us for three years. Before that, Anna and I, I mean, look, I was kind of living hand to mouth as an artist. We were relying on Arts Council projects. And when you don't get that funding, there's very little to sort of live on and definitely nothing to run a project on. So the three years even has been amazing. But we started talking with Creative Civic Change about what if, what if we could propose to funders to fund much, much longer term, you know? Um, and then uh, that sort of opened up, kind of opening up this conversation with other organisations. They started thinking about um, the elements of their 100 year garden. So for instance, one organisation talked about composting, composting ideas, and that they considered their organisation as a compost heap. So composting means that it's fertile, but some people think it's ugly and it smells. So they don't see the wonder at the end. Um, but obviously lots of us who are composting can kind of see the longer term kind of help and impact there. Um, someone also talked about hollyhocks and gladioli. So they're a really big show and worth waiting for, but they need keeping safe. Um, so, and, and also you can gather the seeds. And that was kind of in relation to community leaders. So community leaders like dahlias, they bloom beautifully, but need to be taken care of. Lift them and let them rest, but they can't be visible all the time. So yeah, I kind of want to open up this conversation. I know we've only got uh, 15 minutes left. I'm gonna stop sharing in a second, but using the 100 year garden idea, it might be useful for us to think about the longer term uh, change. Uh, sorry, how does longer term change thing? How does the longer term change things for us? Sorry, <laughs> thinking, you know, as far ahead as 100 years for now, from now. And what do what we want to see growing in the community landscape of the future? So thinking of us all as, um, and, and representing ourselves as part of one big garden. So I'm just escaping that. Sorry, I've got a, a black screen again. Um, okay, and I'm gonna stop share. Okay, so I hope that was helpful. Um, sorry, I did that thing where, um, you know, on Zoom, you sort of forget that you're like where you are. <laughs> and uh, so the first five minutes I had to kind of like just to get myself together. I hope that was all OK, but please, any questions, I'm very happy to answer. The 100 year plan is kind of it. So we're fleshing out that kind of concept at the moment and we're applying for funding to run a program next year that like basically puts down our terms of the 100 year plan as a neighborhood. Um, so that's kind of where, where we're at with that. I hope that makes sense. I just thought that was powerfully beautiful. Uh, and I couldn't think of a better way to spend an hour on a Friday afternoon. Oh, Angela, that's lovely. Yeah, it was <laughs> absolutely powerfully beautiful, you know, and I'm sure that people in the room have got lots of comments or about what struck you or, you know, kind of want to respond to the question. So please do help yourself and, uh, you know, unmute yourself and join the conversation. I, I just wanted to um, yeah, say thank you because I did I found it fascinating and, and there's loads of democracy type questions I, but I just wanted to kind of say something about the birds I found that so touching like I love birds and that that sense of how the birds became neighbours and and the awareness through the destruction I live in the part of Sheffield where they they try to chop down the trees as well so it's a very local thing but uh, yeah, funny, I don't know, that really touched me, just like that sense that our neighbours are not just human beings. Um, I do think that's such an important um, insight, really, but easily lost in the midst of, I think, tankeriness and all the other crap I get involved in. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I think it's, um, on the one hand, recognising the birds and wildlife as our neighbours made our community feel bigger and stronger 
And so, yeah, it was all the more sort of like painful basically when that happened. But I think um, it's been really important for us to kind of tool up and um, inform ourselves basically about our rights in a situation like that, but also create space with that developer and the planning team to make demands about what needs to happen as a result of that and what we expect as a community. So at the moment we're negotiating a community orchard to be there'd be some kind of repair there. Um, but also what it taught us was when we turned around to the developer um, and said, this is wrong, they said, well, actually the ecology report for the area doesn't evidence that there are tawny owls or any of those birds. And when we looked at the ecology report, sure enough, the neighborhood hasn't, there's no representation of it whatsoever. And then a little bit of research showed that in kind of working class areas, there's very rarely um, a evidenced ecology report. So that made us feel all the more sort of empowered to, to represent the ecology of the neighborhood and we've started doing that you know reporting it basically um so it's been helpful in in on that uh but yeah it, it was yeah it was incredibly frustrating look i'm from london I'm from elephant and castle and that's where a lot of this kind of comes from is the regeneration schemes there never represented the people that lived in the area. They represented the people that they wanted to move there and everything was flattened and it became soulless. So I feel fairly informed from that experience and I'm able to kind of share that experience and that knowledge with residents here in Stoke. Cause I sadly believe that, you know, the, a developer in in London is the same as a developer in Stoke you know and so um yeah I've kind of it's it's good to kind of feel like we're in a kind of quite a strong neighborhood that can kind of call that out and there be conversation that tries to sort of address it but yeah I've gone off on a tangent sorry but yeah thanks <laughs> um I'd just like to say I think it also speaks to the importance of re relationship and when you realise a relationship with something, mm. how it can change uh, the thinking and the way we're looking at it. Um, and in reference to your question around the importance of having a 100-year project, I think quite often it can be really good to start from your ultimate vision and work, work back and that to me, that um, with a project I'm looking at at the moment seems to be a way that can really enliven people um, to, to really bring to life what they would like to see and then give them energy to, to move towards that. Yeah, definitely. That's it. It's just totally opened our minds to possibilities and feels very empowering, very confidence building. But also then when you think a hundred years from now and as a in a hundred year plan kind of terms, for me, it's also made, oh, well, a five year plan's nothing. So we sort of <laughs> went about and did, went kind of about writing a five year plan for our organization recently. And it just seemed easier perhaps than it might have done before. I, I find that kind of thing usually very overwhelming, but um, it made it a lot easier. So yeah, I think it does kind of open up loads of possibilities, isn't it? Definitely. But yeah, I really, I agree about relationships. I think that that's a really important point. And I think that's really beautiful, that kind of connection to each other um, and our relationship to the land as well. Yes. that we're living in, yeah. I, I've, got a, I've got a million questions I, I, and some of them are, are, are really dull around sort of process and procedure. Um, so maybe not the, the time to go into that now, but just in terms of things like um, governance and it was interesting to hear that you did have council people on your local panel and are they from the planning team and how, how, what is the interaction like? I mean, obviously you've, you've been very positive about it, but have there been any sessions around just 
listening so rather your councils often just do things without listening so have you had to do sort of sessions on what does it mean to actually listen and and work with communities on that very equal footing yeah so I think that's an important point because um we have two meetings we have a services meeting and we have uh, the community panel meeting um and as i said members of services are part of our panel planning no because they have very little interest outside of their job um at stoke city council anyway from our experience um but we have the community team and social behavior team the uh, environment team and um, uh, and then policing. But it's important to have the services meeting very separate to our community decision-making panel meeting because the panel meetings are about listening and being explicit about creating that space for listening. The services meeting, we never chair. It's important to us to never chair that because something that we're very passionate about is um, calling out where it's not our job um, because we're not experts in the stuff that they are experts in or, or should be or it's their job to be um, because then we're sort of running the risk of doing their job for them and that's that's very risky at a time of loads of cuts. So the services meetings um, happen every other month where uh, we call out various issues on the street and then the following meeting will be what and the, the service is kind of explaining what they did to address um, those issues and um, and then the panel meetings are more about listening kind of programming where the money's being spent and the decision making the governance is something that we're really trying to flesh out and and may and kind of define better so we've had some help from shared assets on that but they recently did this online um workshop for our community decision making panel meeting and it was really dry and we lost <laughs> residents during that meeting <laughs> i was getting text messages from mums going, what's a stakeholder and what is this bloke put on about? So, and I was like, yeah, fair enough. And I, you know, and I had to sort of say to shared assets, this actually isn't the way that we operate. We need to have a meal. This needs to be sociable. We need to, because in the past we've like eaten a pie and we asked residents, okay, if this pie is the programme, how much of the pie do you want for sports? How much of the pie do you want for decision making? So it's that, it's just really simple kind of ways of listening to one another, but also that we're kind of getting some answers there as well that are really helpful for us to kind of shape the organisation. Does that help? Does that make sense? Does that yeah, no. Absolutely. I mean, it's it's interesting to say that you've sort of separated that mm. those two areas quite distinctly. Um, in terms of just sorry, didn't want to dominate. Just how do you sort of have that balance between the need to pay bills for your all, just for running what you do, um, and not wanting to sort of charge too much for people to come and use it. I don't. I mean, I I don't know the detail of how you operate and how if people contribute. What they what they feel that they can afford, or it's just how do you how do you pay your bills? So that's a good question. It's really through through funding at the moment. There's some income from the social enterprise, but that just goes back into kind of supporting the social enterprise to keep going. So um, and that I think is going to become tricky, but we hopefully we won't let it become tricky but when we move into the building at the moment we're just operating from the shipping container that's got electricity but there's no loo so people just go home if they need the loo it's very very small scale basic but um yeah so i think that's that's in short that's the kind of answer who knows until we're in that building because um, yeah, I think it's it's largely yeah, it's only funded by creative civic change 
some funding from the council and from Arts Council. Yeah. Okay, okay great. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, has anybody got one burning thing that they've been waiting to, to say that they feel that they would like to say before we, before we close? I just want to say thank you. I coming from Canada and super inspired by I keep an acorn on my desk it is like I, I, I I'm obsessed with acorns it's like nature with hats right um and but today you've given me a whole new um perspective for my acorn so I just wanted to say thank you I'd love to talk more for another day maybe on um the power of art and the the, the process around reducing stigma so yeah, yeah. Thank yeah. you so much. And, and something around governance that fits with, with communities too, isn't there? That, that's because there's nothing really out there that's just fits right, is there? You know, it's all that would be interesting too, isn't it? And thank you for demonstrating so eloquently and so beautiful about power grows in abundance in and amongst people. Mm, yeah. uh, and, and when it's firmly rooted to the ground. That's it. It's the rooting. Yeah. It's also, yeah, focusing on the roots and not on, what's it? Focusing on the roots and not on the fruits. Yeah. But uh, I love your nature with hat, with a hat, because oh, yeah. it is also, yeah, I like thinking of the art projects as the hats, actually, maybe. <laughs> yeah. So thank you very much, Rebecca. It's been a joy to have you. Oh, no. um, thank you for having us yeah it's great okay. to be here and that'd be I'd be really interested in carrying on this discussion yeah. and and particularly around governance as we're trying to figure that out with our residents as well yeah it'd be good to bring together different groups who are trying to figure it out with residents so maybe we could get residents to figure it out <laughs> yeah that would be great <laughs> yeah brilliant what a joy thank you enjoy the rest of your Friday, everybody. Take good care.